excited to be speaking to you today. Glad that you're here as we come closer to this Thanksgiving Christmas season. Um, before we get into the Word and we study together, I want to bring your attention to two of those announcements that we saw. And the first is this next week, we're going to have our final starting point of the year. And starting point is basically everything that has to do with grace, our DNA, our history. It's an opportunity to meet some of our pastors and ministry leaders and also hear from them. So we would love to have you at that. Like the video mentioned, we're going to have child care and we're going to have a free lunch. I'm going to say it again. Free lunch. <laughs> Next week. We'd love to have you there right through these double doors after the third service right around the corner here in the WCC. Also, another announcement, Beach baptism. If you've been wanting to take that next step or if you have a student that's been wanting to take that next step, you've put your faith in Jesus, you know that he's changed you. He's working in your life and you're doing great things because of what he's done on the cross and you've trusted in him. You express that through baptism, this outward expression that people see that you've given yourself to one and that one is Jesus. We would love to have you there. Even if you've been baptized, we would love to have you come out on December 8th at 5 p.m. at Ocean Reef Park. We would love to have you there. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that before our year ends because the year went so fast. All right, if you have your Bibles, if you have a Bible app, go ahead and turn them to the fourth book in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. We're going to be in chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. The solas. We've been studying these solas for the past few weeks, and the first one that we spoke of was sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. What does that mean? That means that the authority in your life is not me. That means the authority in your life should come from this book. That means that when everything else in the world is changing and things seem uncertain and you're wondering why are things happening this way, God stays the same. And we go back to his word because it doesn't change. And we can trust that even with all these different things happening in our lives that don't seem okay or that we're unsure of, we come back to the fact that God tells us how to live, why he calls us to live that way. And it's not because he's putting barriers in our life. No, he's actually protecting us. And he's guiding us. So sola scriptura, the word we live by, it, it's our authority. And then last week, Pastor Jeff talked about sola fide, which means faith alone, that we're saved by receiving Jesus Christ through faith. And today, I want to talk about our third sola, which is sola gratia there in your notes, which means grace alone. And last week, we, we had this great verse that we, we see it in here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says this, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Notice how it all works together, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This verse tells us that Christians are saved by grace alone. It's so clear. Now, why are these solas important? Why are we talking about this? Why does it matter? They matter because it's easy for us to lose our way. Right? It's easy for us to think that we're walking a certain way and we're, and we're talking a certain way and we're making these choices in our lives and we think these choices are okay, but then all of a sudden we wake up years later, decades later, hopefully not, and we wonder, what did I live my life for? And I know that there's some people in the, in the world that I've talked to on earth right here in South Florida and I've, and I've talked to them and they wonder, have I wasted my years? And we're talking about these solas because God's truth can be manipulated and shackled. Not only do we have these barriers in life that keep us from God, but even when we think we're following God, we wonder, are we actually following him truly? The things that I'm listening to, the, the way that I'm living, how I've been raised, are they actually hurting or helping my faith? And they matter because we're a people that are forgetful and we constantly need reminders. In a day where we're so connected and we have digital calendars and we have reminders and we have all these different things on our phones, we also have that other little button that we love right after we get these reminders. Maybe you know this button, the snooze button. Right? And we hit that button just as much at times because we're forgetful and we can get lazy. And it's so easy for that to happen, to snooze things in our lives. And 500 plus years ago, the church lost its way. It lost its way and it started leading people astray. And it started telling people to live the way that God did not call them to live. And it was all about tradition and it was all about how you need to do more. 
in your life than what God has already called you to. And what happened is, because of this, a movement and a reformation was sparked. And the goal was to undo the corruption and the instruction that was leading people astray. Because it's so easy for that to happen, and it's easy for us to fall into a spiritual slumber or grow up in different parts of the world, and specifically here in South Florida, where you can go unchurched or never churched at all. And it's so easy, and these solos sparked a revolution then, and my prayer is, I hope they spark a revolution today, because back then what happened was something was recovered Something was new or renewed, and, and we're familiar with these words, right, to, be, to recover, to be renewed. I want to give you some examples of that. A few months ago, I took 30 middle school students, I'm going to say that again, middle school students, right, on a bus, and you can imagine how that bus ride went, and we went to a very clean facility where there's a ton of trampolines. Have you seen these places? these trampoline parks. So I went there, and you know, when I take students out, I'm always worried about a few things, especially middle school students, because we might think teenagers, like high schoolers don't think. I don't, know, I don't even know if middle schoolers sometimes have a brain, right? So my goal, but, but I love them, right? They're like, they love us. They, they love you so easily. They love, and, and, um, and I'm taking these students, and my main goal, it's, it's usually threefold. I hope I don't lose one. I hope no one dies. And I think my last one is probably the worst one. You may not think it is. I hope nobody gets hurt, right? And you talk about a place where hurt can happen, right? So I get there, and I'm with these students, and we're excited, and we put on these glow-in-the-dark socks and all these different instructions, and then, and then we go in, and I go in, <coughs> and this is my first time being in a place like this, <coughs> and I'm jumping, and I jump in this, in this ball pit like I'm at Chuck E. Cheese, and I'm struggling to get out, and then a leader comes up to me, and he says, Tony, why are you here on this side? This is the kids' section. And I said, this is the kids' section. I barely got out of that ball pit, right? But who cares? I go over, and I'm with the leaders, and you got you to gotta save face with these middle schoolers. And, and I'm jumping, and I'm going up and down. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. I'm going up high, like 10, 15, who knows, 20 feet. And I'm talking to a leader as I'm jumping. I was like, yeah, let's keep moving. And I come down, and I sprain my ankle. Five minutes into jumping. Right, So I'm the one worried about having to call someone's mom, and then I'm the one hobbling out because I called my wife to take me home. I promise you all of 2020 will be me recovering my reputation with my middle school students. So, um, but it happened, right? I needed to recover, and even my ankle now still bothers me because of it. Um, but I needed to recover from that injury, and things weren't the same, and, and it wasn't good. Or we just, we just love new things, right? Like we love watching TV and seeing things like QVC, right? And we're like, I am tempted. Or for some of you that didn't know, there's like a new QVC called Amazon Live, we are, oh, wow, some of you have spent money there. Okay, right? And we have Amazon Live or shows like The Price is Right, which have been running forever, right? And we love seeing them win prizes or cash and get excited. And we're like, if I was there, I would have bet this much money, right? But what's the one thing we love seeing on The Price is Right? Somebody tell me. Car, right? It's a brand new car. And everybody just flips out. And we love that, right? We love new things. We love new phones. We love having that brand new. I don't know how many cameras they're going to put on phones. Before we know it, there's just going to be one big camera on the back, right? If it's an iPhone or Samsung or whatever it is that you have or a new car or a newer car than the one that you have now or a new home or a new relationship, right? We love these kind of things. In 2 Kings, if you want to write it down in your notes, in chapters 22 and 23, we see this renewal during the days of King Josiah. And what happens is this is after King David and King Solomon, and it seems like some kings have come after these, these kings that followed God and knew God personally. And then some bad kings came along, and then finally King Josiah, a young king who became king at the age of eight. Imagine that. Years later, after becoming king, what happened is they, haven't, they hadn't had the word of God for so long. And then one of his priests goes into the temple, and they find the law of God. And this priest begins to read it to Josiah, and he's convicted and cut at the heart. And then he brings the people together, and he says, listen, we're going to renew our faith and our relationship with God. We're going to recommit. We're going we're to make a new covenant with God. And the people agreed, and they did that. And then it says this in 2 Kings 22. In verses 24 through to 25, Josiah got rid of all the mediums, all the spiritists, the household gods, the idols, basically anything that was anti-God that had to do 
with, with anything other than Yahweh, their God, and all other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. This he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book that Hilkiah the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after that, <clears throat> Josiah was there. Before or after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Renewal. That's what you see in that passage. A recovery was happening in the days of Josiah. And I promise you and I pray we need that today. And God's been in the business of that since the beginning of time, since the days of Adam and Eve. God is calling us back to him to restore us and to renew us just like in the days of Josiah. And Jesus Christ is the one that leads humanity back to what our lives were intended to be, the way he designed it. And because of his sacrifice, any person can recover from their brokenness. And the best place to start is in the Gospel of John chapter 1. Go to verse 14 with me. This is what it says. And the word of God became flesh. Jesus came down from heaven. And when he came down from, from heaven, if you have your Bibles or, or your Bible app, underline this next word, and he dwelt. He dwelt among us. I love that word because in the, New, in the Old Testament, the whole idea of God being with people was he, he was in a tabernacle or he actually was among them before the tabernacle. But literally, God was in a tabernacle or in a temple and people went before him. Here it says that the word became flesh, and then he dwelt among us. He literally tabernacled. He pitched his tent here on earth as a human among us. I love that example there. And we have seen his glory, glory as, the only, as of the only son from the Father, and then underline this, full of grace and truth. Go down to verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses and then there it, is again. there it is again, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Here's my goal this morning, is to answer these three questions that I think matter and make this clear as we talk about sola gratia. What is grace? Who needs grace? How do I receive grace? What is grace? Who needs grace? How do I receive grace? What is grace? Let's start with the first one. Grace is unmerited, unearned favor from God. While justice is getting what we deserve and mercy is not getting what we deserve, grace is even more than that. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. That's the power of grace. Grace is God's goodness towards those who only deserve punishment. That's God's grace. God's grace tells us in verse 14 that Jesus is the one that's full of not just grace, but grace and truth to guide us. And these two attributes, grace and truth, are closely connected to salvation in the Bible. God's word teaches us that salvation is believing in the truth of the gospel, what Jesus has done on the cross for us, and receiving that saving grace of Jesus. And there's no saving grace except to those who believe the truth of the gospel. And for those who need a word picture of this, let me give you an example of that. That first word, grace, that's the Greek word charis. And that word is related to a Hebrew word, and here's that Hebrew word, chesed. Let's say that together. Ready? One, two, three. Go ahead. Oh, some of you panicked. All right. Chesed. All right. Chesed. All right. That word literally means loving kindness. Loving kindness. And then you go to the second term, the word truth, aletheia, is rooted in the Hebrew word emet, which means faithfulness or steadfastness. Now put that together. Look at, what, look at what it spells out. I love the Bible. It's so intentional. Even in just two words, this is what it says. Jesus is full of gracious, loving kindness, and steadfast faithfulness. Isn't that amazing? Two words. That's who Jesus is. He's full of loving kindness and steadfast faithfulness. Jesus is the full expression of God's grace and truth. Who needs grace? Who needs grace? Who needs a doctor? People that are sick. Who needs money? You're thinking, everyone in this room, Christmas is coming, right? Who needs grace? I need grace. Everyone needs grace. Everyone here, everyone out in the world needs grace. Romans 3.23 talks about our human condition, 
our spiritual condition, it says this, for all have sinned. Let me define that word all for you. It means all. Everyone has sinned. Every single person falls short of the glory of God. And then Ephesians 2 verse 1, it says this, and you were once dead, dead in your trespasses and sin. Every person outside of Jesus has one spiritual condition, death. Every man, every woman, every student, and every child has one condition, and that is that they are dead. That's you, and that's me. And we can no more draw near to God than a corpse could raise himself out of the grave by his own strength. We can't. That's how bad off we are outside of Jesus Christ. But I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. You know what it says? It says this, but God. But God. God, grace is what saves us. Ephesians 2 verse 8, grace is the core of the gospel. Grace gives us victory over sin, James chapter 4, and grace gives us eternal hope, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Then you go to verse 16 of John chapter 1, and it says, for from his fullness, it's full of grace and truth, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace, or like we said earlier, we receive loving kindness upon loving kindness. Kindness. How do I receive grace? Well, the Bible teaches that grace is a gift. And now with Christmas approaching faster than we can imagine, we love receiving gifts. I don't know about you. I will be a 70-year-old man, hopefully, and I will still love receiving gifts, gifts. But there's something about giving a gift, right? Like, have you ever seen a child? Of course you have, and how excited they are when they receive a gift. And they get so excited. And I remember I have an 18-year-old brother. So you can imagine when my parents told me when I was 16, you're going to have a brother. And I said, now I'm leaving. I wanted a brother when I was five, right? But my brother, <coughs> I was, he was six years old. He's 18 now. He was six years old. <coughs> and I'll never forget this one Christmas where, um, where he wakes up and, you know, he's there. He's opening the gifts and he's excited. And I'll never forget he had a little mushroom haircut and a pair of underwear on. That's all he had on. He woke us up in a pair of underwear and he wanted to open all his gifts so he's done opening all his gifts, and my parents are like, hey, did you like everything, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course. Hey, can you do me a favor, J.D.? Can you go over to the garage and get me something? Can you get me something in the garage? And, and that's what parents do, right? They, they make us suffer till the end. And then we go to the, he goes to the garage, and we're there, we're, I didn't even know what was going on, and I'm kind of waiting. And he goes in there, and, he, and I'm sure he, he, I remember seeing he could barely hit the light switch in his underwear that I mentioned that. So he hits the light switch, and he goes in there, and I just hear a shriek and a scream. And he just comes back and he goes, ah, I got a four-wheeler. I got an ATV. Right? So we're like, oh, we're so excited. He goes, let's go. Right? And so we go out there in the garage. My dad hasn't even opened the garage. And he just goes, on. he's just about to hit the garage. And he's so excited. And, I, and that was so long ago. That was 12 years ago. And I still remember how excited he was. Do we get that excited about grace? I want to get that excited about grace. And about what God has done. Every single day I want to wake up and get that excited because here's the truth. I don't always. I don't always wake up wanting to read my Bible. I don't always wake up feeling that grateful for what God has done for me and continues to do through me. And I hope that you get that. I hope that makes sense. That we're saved by grace and grace alone. If it's not by grace alone, if it's not alone, it's not grace. It's not. That's what Romans 11 teaches us. To to be saved by grace alone means you don't save yourself. Grace does. Christ has. It's finished. That's what Jesus said on the cross. Grace works without requiring anything on our part. Anything, without anything. It's not expensive. It's not even cheap. It's free. And God offers it. I love the way Tony Evans puts it. He puts it this way. Pastor Tony Evans, the fact that you live a better life do better things, and you're a nicer person may make you a better neighbor, but it doesn't make you fit for heaven. That can only happen by grace. Suppose three men wanted to swim to Hawaii. Well, one may swim farther than the others, but all three would end up dead because Hawaii's too far. That's all he would say it to. God is too high. He's too holy for us even on our best days, weeks, or years to make ourselves acceptable to him. Our, our salvation is based on God's grace. And then the end of verse 17, we're reminded a second time that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
is the source which captures our hearts and minds. And that's why we can faithfully say that by grace, for by grace you have been saved. God enabled us through grace to deny ungodliness and these worldly pleasures and these things that keep us from God in so many areas of our lives. By grace alone, through faith alone, and next week we're going to learn even more through Christ alone. And only through Christ. Jesus came to liberate us, to free us from the weight of having to make it on our own. He came to liberate us from the burden to have to get it right all the time because we can't. Jesus came to take away the obligation to fix ourselves and find ourselves and free ourselves. Again, because we can't. He came to release us from the need to be right, to be rewarded, to be regarded, and to be respected. He came to set the captives free. That's still true today. Set us free. I want to share one more story with you about a father taking his young boys to the fair. And this is how the story goes. Father took his boys to the fair. He went to the ticket booth and he bought a row of tickets and he dispensed it to his sons. And then one of his sons saw a school friend and he brought him over to introduce him to his father. And the school friend went over to the father and introduced himself and then asked for a ticket. And the father held back the tickets and said, I'm sorry, I can't give you a ticket. I need to hang on to them so that my, my boys can, can be able to ride these rides today. But his son said, that's okay, Dad. I don't mind sharing. You can give it to him. When the father heard the son give his okay, the father dispensed the ticket for the fare to the young man in the name of his son. Listen, when you come to the father, he looks at the son for his okay. Why? Because the gift of the ticket is dependent on the son. The gift of the ticket is dependent on the son, and that's what we call grace. I don't know where you are today. You may be, right now your relationship with Christ may be the strongest it's ever been, and he's allowed you to come out of some tough things. I'll tell you what, that's my story right now where, where God has gotten me through some tough things this year with my wife and a surgery and all these different things that we had to struggle through. But through your prayers and the prayers of this church, I am here and I am standing and I am grateful. And right now maybe you're struggling and you're just kind of holding on the best you can, but you're wondering if you can hold on. Or for some of you, you're in the room right now, and you don't even know if God could forgive even of one of the things you've done that you feel shame and guilt and bad over that you've done in your life. Whether you've done it recently or in the past, you just can't live it out. Maybe there's someone in your life holding you back. Maybe it's, it's a person. Maybe it's a lifestyle. Whatever it may be right now, you're not sure if grace is for you. And yet, what, what did we say earlier? Grace is for everyone. Everyone. It doesn't matter your skin color, your gender. It doesn't matter where you came from, your culture. Grace is for everyone. I hope you get that this morning. Because here's the truth. Here's what we bring to the table. You ready? This is what we bring to the table before God. We bring sin. That's the best we have. We bring sin and struggle and the fact that we can't meet this standard and we'll never be able to face God on our own and think that we are holy or we're just good people because we're not. And yet this is where God's grace shatters our misconceptions and our doubts and our struggles and our guilt. Because when you trust in Jesus and his death, his burial, oh, and more than anything, his resurrection. And we come to him and we believe with our hearts and confess with our mouth like Romans 10 says. And you'll be saved. This is when and only when. When Jesus sees when, when he sees you, when God sees you, you know what he sees? He doesn't see sin. He sees what Jesus has done. And he's forgiven you. And he's forgiven all your sin. And he sees his son and he welcomes you back. And listen, that ticket is more than just a ticket to heaven. It's more than just a ticket to heaven. He welcomes you home as a son and a daughter with value and with purpose. And now he's saying, go. That's why we come to Jesus. We don't just come to Jesus because we want to make it to heaven. We come to Jesus because he has something for us.